the kinetics of organic reactions. So we spent the last couple of lessons in this chapter dealing with the thermodynamics of organic reactions, and now we're going to deal with rates and the kinetics of organic reactions. And finally, we'll finish this chapter off dealing with uh, specifically organic reaction mechanisms in the last couple of lessons. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad. Welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to make science both understandable and even enjoyable, if it be possible. Now, this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications, you'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so kinetics here. So you might remember from your general chemistry class, that's uh, pretty much you can find out everything you want to know about a reaction from the thermodynamics except for one thing. And that one thing is how fast. So thermodynamics can tell you if it'll happen or not, if it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous. It'll tell you if heat's going to be absorbed or released, if it's going to lead to an increase in disorder, i.e. entropy, or a decrease. So thermodynamics can tell you if the reactants or products are going to be favored. Equilibrium constants are part of that. So, But the one thing thermodynamics can't tell you is how fast. It can't tell you anything about the rate of the reaction. And so that's going to be what we talk about here with our kinetics of organic reactions. And first thing I want to remind you of are rate laws. And rate laws are just a mathematical relationship that show you how fast a reaction goes based on what the concentration of the reactants are. So here we've got A and B, and those are typically reactants not products in a rate law. So, and then these lovely exponents here are called the orders. So, and what we'll find is that for organic chemistry, uh, your rate laws are going to be a lot simpler than what you would have seen in your general chemistry class. In your gen chem class, we might have given you a bunch of thermodynamic data, or sorry, kinetic data. So let's get that right. So some kinetic data and had you figure out, you know, these orders and stuff like that. So, but in this case, really, we're going to hit this on more of a surface level and stuff like that. This will be much easier than what you saw in your gen chem class. So, but these still are the orders. They're often integers. You learned it in gen chem they won't have to be integers, but in OCHEM, they're just going to be integers. That's the only ones you're going to see. It doesn't have to be that way, but we're going to restrict ourselves almost exclusively to ones that they will be. Now, you might recall from Gen Chem that these orders so don't necessarily have to be the coefficients in an overall reaction. So, however, you did learn also that they are the same as the coefficients in what's called an elementary reaction, one that can't be broken up into simpler steps. And, and it turns out we're really only going to look at this in the context of examining elementary steps, either because a reaction is a single step reaction like this one, or just because we're going to be looking and focusing in on what we call the slow step or the rate determining step, like in this one. So this isn't a complete reaction, but it's just the slow step of a reaction you learn about later. But in examining just a single step at a time, an elementary step, so we'll find out that these exponents, these orders, match the coefficients in the balanced reaction. All right, so if we take a look here, we've got a couple of these reactions here, at least one step here, the most important step of this reaction. And then this is just a single step reaction. This is the whole reaction. And because these are elementary reactions, elementary steps, we can get the rate law just by looking at them. So for this one here, we'll just have rate equals some sort of rate constant, lowercase k. Don't confuse that with the equilibrium constant, which is a capital K. So, and then times the concentration of your reactants. In this case, the only reactant we have is one of these. Now, if for some reason we would have had a coefficient of two right here, well, then we would have put a, a square right here instead, but that wasn't the case here. So I just want to point that out. And so because there's only one of this lovely reactant molecule showing up in the reaction as reactant, then it's only going to be to the first power. And that's the one that's kind of implied. We don't actually write the one in typically. But if you do, it's not wrong. So, But this would be described what we call first order. And with just a single reactant molecule, we might refer to this as unimolecular. So cool, when an elementary reaction has a single reactant and just one molecule of it, we say it's unimolecular. Cool, and this next one here, so we see that in this case, again, this is a single step reaction. It's an elementary reaction, can't be broken up into simpler steps. But now we've got two reactants. And so we refer to this elementary reaction as bimolecular. And we'll find out that overall, our rate law is gonna end up being second order, which will correlate with that. And so in this one, we'll still have a rate constant K. So, but now with two reactants, one of each, they're both going to show up in the rate law first order with respect to each. 
And so it's first order with respect to the, this reactant, first order with respect to the cyanide as well. So, but your overall reaction order, you might remember from Gen Chem, is adding up the individual reactant order. So first order for this guy, first order for this guy, second order overall, we'd say. And so for a unimolecular react, uh, elementary reaction, we're gonna have a first order rate law. And for a bimolecular reaction, we'd have a second order rate law. Cool, and this will be very relevant uh, in a couple of chapters here when we start dealing with substitution and elimination reactions. All right, now I wanna take a look and focus on the rate constant in our rate laws. So we can see that the rate is proportional to that rate constant, so a higher rate constant means a faster rate, and a lower rate constant means a slower rate. So I wanna kinda of take a look at a couple of things here in regard to that. So first off, that rate constant is affected by two things. So, and one of them is temperature. So if you get a higher temperature, you're going to get a higher value for that rate constant. So they're totally temperature dependent. You would have seen this in your general chemistry class, and it might have shown up in the context of the Arrhenius equation, which we don't care about uh, for OCHEM here. So this relationship, you definitely should know. Higher temperature, higher rate constant. But you should also know that as you, if you have a lower activation energy, you're also going to have a higher rate constant in that case as well. So both these are things you should take home, and, and this could, should kind of make intuitive sense. So if you have a higher temperature, so molecules are moving faster, they collide more often, and you get a faster rate. And the reason you get a faster rate is because you get a faster rate constant. And that's your relationship there. And then also, if you have a lower activation energy, well, then it's going to be easier to get over that hill, if you will, or at least more molecules have enough energy to get over that hill is really the way it works. And so you'll have a higher rate constant and a higher rate as well there as well. So these are the two relationships you should know. So, but there's also a couple things we could look at if we have like a multi-step reaction. So like this one here. And so and this one you should recognize as being a two-step reaction reaction so with two hills so that's got two steps and each hill has its own transition state so in this case two transition states and they both have their own associated activation energy so from where we start to the top of the hill that's the activation energy for step one and right here from where we start to the top of the hill that's the activation energy for step two so this would be our reactant over here. This would be our product. And this local minimum right here would be the intermediate. So notice we haven't seen an intermediate yet, but you only get intermediates if you have multi-step reactions. So reactant product, but any local minimums in between are gonna be intermediates. Now you always have one transition state per step. So a two-step reaction, two transition states, but you're always gonna have one fewer intermediates. So two-step reaction, one intermediate, three-step reaction, two intermediates, so on and so forth. So also therefore one fewer intermediate than transition states in a reaction. Now, in this case, we can totally see that that first step has a much larger activation energy, and so we'll call it the slow step, or we might call it the rate determining step as well. It's typically the way that works. And so in this case, we can see that activation energy one is much greater than activation energy two on this reaction coordinate diagram. So what that means in terms of our rate constant, and again, notice that again, there's that inverse relationship between your activation energy and your rate constant. This means in this case that the rate constant for step two would actually be bigger than the rate constant for step one. So the one with a smaller activation energy is gonna have a larger value for the rate constant. So they might give you a multi-step uh, uh, reaction mechanism like this, diagram that a reaction coordinate diagram, and have you start comparing either activation energies or comparing rate constant values, which is that, again, that inverse relationship, something along those lines. Next thing I wanna talk about is something that got a little bit, little bit of attention in the course called the Hammond postulate. And uh, Hammond postulate is gonna tell you something about what your transition state looks like. And we've got this lovely reaction coordinate diagram for this single step reaction I'm showing you here. And in this case, with the product being lower energy than the reactant, this is an exothermic reaction. So and ultimately what the, the Hammond postulate tells you is that your transition state is gonna look both like your reactant and your product, but it's typically gonna look like one more than the other, whichever one it is closer in energy to. So in this case, our transition state at the top of the hill is closer in energy to the reactant than it is to the product. And that's always gonna be the case for an exothermic step. So in this case, it'll look more like the reactant and less like the product. It's still gonna resemble both, just more like that reactant. 
in this case. For an endothermic reaction, or an endothermic step anyways, the transition state would look more like the product instead, because it would be closer in energy to that. Now, let's look at what that actually means in the context of the reaction for which this diagram is for. So this is our reaction here. It turns out uh, this is one of the reactions we'll learn in a little bit. So, and all I want to focus on is we're going to draw the transition state, and we don't draw transition states all the time for every mechanism, but we will draw a few of them, and typically what you do is you put it in brackets and you put the little double dagger symbol there. So up in the upper right hand corner, and what you're going to show is every bond that is either being formed or broken is going to show up as a partial bond in your transition state. So first thing I'll look and say, okay, what new bonds uh, are being formed on the product side? And I'm going to highlight them with a red arrow or red line here. That's our new bond. We didn't have a bond between carbon and the OH before, but now we do. And then we want to look back at the reactant side and say what bonds were broken. And in this case, I can see that I've got this carbon bromine bond that's no longer present. So that's the bond we're going to be breaking. And therefore, in the transition state, they're both going to be partial bonds. Because here the bond is the, you know, present, here it's absent. In the transition state, when you're in transition, it would be not completely there, but not completely gone, you know, kind of a thing. And so in transition, it's a partial bond. Let's see what that kind of looks like here. <coughs> All right, so there's the carbon with its three hydrons. I'm drawing a little funky, and don't worry about the geometry just yet. This is something we will teach you about this specific reaction later on. But the big thing I just want you to see is the partial bonds. And so here we've got a partial bond to bromine and a partial bond to the OH. So here's the old bond that is breaking, and here's the new bond that is forming. And then we gotta do one more thing here. So I see that the OH, the oxygen actually has a, a negative formal charge in the reactant, but no charge in the product. And so then in the transition state, it would be partially negative. So same thing for bromine, it's neutral in the reactant, but ends up with a negative one charge. And so when it's in transition along the way, it will be partially negative. Now, the thing we can learn from the Hammond postulate here, though, is we can actually figure out which one of these has more of the partial negative charge in that transition state. And again, the key is that in this case, because the step is exothermic, because this reaction is exothermic, so that the transition state is going to resemble the reactant more than the product. And since it's the reactant that has the negative charge on the oxygen, where it's the product that has the negative charge on the bromine, well, this transition state looks more like this less like this. And so, well, the reactants have the negative charge on the oxygen, on the OH. And so it turns out there's going to, it's not 50-50. It's not like half a negative charge here and half a negative charge here. It's going to be more than half on the oxygen and less than half the negative charge on the bromine. And so in this case, we can actually tell something a little more than just saying they're both partially negative. Turns out we can figure out that the oxygen is more partially negative than the bromine, according to the Hammond postulate. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in this section on kinetics is a catalyst. And there are six characteristics of a catalyst you're going to want to know. And we'll take a look at uh, just what a catalyst is really quick first. So those characteristics, uh, at least half of them will become pretty, pretty obvious here. So if we look at this reaction here, and this is the reaction profile here, the reaction coordinate diagram for this lovely reaction. This is one we'll study later on this semester in the first semester. Uh, and in this case, it turns out, though, that the activation energy is so high for this reaction that it largely just does not happen at room temperature. So and it turns out you can't heat this hot enough to be very effective and stuff like that without these igniting or something along these lines. So it's not super helpful. So but what we can do is we can add a catalyst and it turns out like platinum or palladium or nickel is a fairly common metal catalyst uh, that's really effective for this reaction. What that catalyst does here on the reaction energy diagram So notice you still start at the same reactant, you still end up at the same product. However, you're gonna have a much lower activation energy along this pathway. And so as a result, the reaction's gonna go a lot faster, you're gonna end up with a lot larger rate constant, so on and so forth. So what you're supposed to know about a catalyst is a catalyst speeds up a reaction, characteristic number one, okay? Not rocket science. How does it speed up a reaction? Because it lowers the activation energy, characteristic number two. So catalyst speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy. How does it lower the activation energy? It just has the reaction proceed along a totally different or alternative mechanism or pathway. So these two pathways are not the same mechanism, it turns out. So uh, one is gonna involve the catalyst and one's not. So catalyst speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy by offering an alternative 
pathway or mechanism for the reaction to occur. So those are your first three characteristics. Now, uh, you should know that uh, the activation energy is lowered for the reaction in both the forward and reverse directions. So notice in the forward direction, I can see that my activation is definitely lower than going to the top of the hill here, but I can also see that if I was trying to do the reverse reaction, I'd end up with a lower activation energy for that reverse reaction as well on that catalyzed pathway. So uh, in this case, your catalyst speeds up a reaction in both directions, and it lowers the activation energy in both directions. And we don't often talk about that, which is why I'm gonna make a special point of it, because we don't pay a lot of lip service to it and don't talk about it too much, but it often shows up as a lovely uh, trivia question on the organic chemistry exam in this section. So catalyst speeds up a reaction in both the forward and reverse directions. How does it do that? By lowering the activation energy in both the forward and reverse directions. Cool, a couple other things you should know is notice that the relative energies of the reactant and product don't change at all. And as a result, it doesn't actually shift the equilibrium either direction. So in this case, because the product's lower energy than the reactants, this reaction would be exothermic, or if I plotted free energy here, it would be exergonic. So, but in either case, whichever one of these lower energies is the one that's gonna be favored at equilibrium. This reaction, this, in this reaction, the product's probably gonna be the one that's favored at equilibrium and stuff like that. And adding a catalyst is not gonna change that. Adding a catalyst doesn't change the value of the equilibrium constant, doesn't shift the equilibrium one way or the other. So if you already have a reaction that's reached equilibrium and you add a catalyst, it does not accomplish a single thing. You should also know that a catalyst is not consumed in a reaction. So a catalyst can catalyze the same reaction over and over and over and over and over again. You might recall that enzymes are proteinaceous biological catalysts uh, in your body or some other organism's body. So, and they're not just like one and done use, right? They're not a one-time use thing. They can, you know, catalyze the same conversion of substrate into product over and over and over again because a catalyst is not consumed in a reaction. Uh, let's see if I missed anything here. Um, no, that's it. So catalyst speeds up a reaction, both directions, lowers the activation energy in both directions. That means it raises the rate constant in both directions. So it does not get consumed, it does not shift the equilibrium, uh, and it does this by providing an alternate pathway or mechanism for the reaction to occur. Now, hopefully much of this lesson was just a review from general chemistry. And if you found this beneficial, please consider giving me a like and a share. A couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you've got questions, by all means, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Now, if you're looking for the study guide that went with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice quizzes, chapter tests, practice final exams for organic chemistry, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.